You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. Friends and welcome to another episode of Way Back Wednesday. I'm your host Randy Adcock. So glad you could be with us tonight. Got a lot of ground to cover tonight. Got a hodgepodge of pictures and headlines and newspaper clippings, and we're going to get to all of those shortly. Um, before we do, however, I want to issue a couple of thank yous. You know, I've said before, but many times, in fact, that this show um, wouldn't be anything without you, the viewer. And you know that that rings true every week uh, for those of you that call in and share your memories or, or share your thoughts about a given topic. Uh, to those that uh, text me or email me during the week and share ideas or share pictures and that happened this week and also those that send me messages and, and kind of give me some background a little more information about some of the topics that we've had on some shows and that was the case this week I got a, a really nice message from Mr. Don Bullock um, who shed some light on the picture. If you remember last week's show we had showed a couple pictures and there was a question that arose about a couple of clubs, the Tar River Boys Club and so forth, and um, I made the comment that I had never heard of the, some of these clubs, and so I'm just going to read to you, uh, this is from, um, like I said, I got this nice message from Don Bullock, and he really kind of filled in. Also, he told me a little bit about, the, we mentioned uh, the, uh, Bernard Taylor uh, Motors car dealership here in town um, in last week's show, and I didn't get around to mention it then, but that was actually a Nash dealer. And uh, Don mentioned that too. But anyway, this is a nice little letter or well, message that Don sent me, and I'll read this to you now. It says Bernard Taylor was in the oil business, and after the war, when he started, um, when they started producing the Nash automobile, he became the dealer for a short period of time. He and his wife Lucille lived on West Thomas Street and had one son, Bernard Jr. In the early 1940s, there were two fraternities and two sororities at Rocky Mount High School. This is the second part of the topic. We were talking about the club and so forth. But he says there were two fraternities and two sororities in Rocky Mount High School. The TNT, the DTD, the SDA, and the ADS. But about 1945, the school board outlawed them. So these were basically just not formal clubs that you would think about as a, an officially recognized club. They were more just clusters of young people, uh, young, young boys and girls in high school. And in 1945, Don says the school board outlawed them. And it said the TNT and the DDT were brother-sister organizations, as were the SDA and the ADS. Uh, TNT and DDT rented a room we called an office on the upper floors of the then Planner Bank building, where we met weekly, and I get and and did. I have no idea other than talk uh, teenage junk. <laughs> Being outlawed, the popularity waned, and they finally went away. About 1947 or 48, a group of high school boys got together probably while camping out or swimming at or near the train trestle that's near the city lake and called themselves the Tar River Trestle Boys, later changed into Tar River Boys. It was just a social club that sometimes had dances or other social events. Remember at that time a small local band could be hired for a few hundred dollars a night. So first of all thank you Don for filling in the information for us um, and you know it's kind of a sideline to that. I've, I've During the research for tonight's show and others as well for that matter I've come across several clubs that used to be in existence in Rocky Mount. Uh, if you remember here a few weeks ago, we talked about um, uh, Carlton Noel's wife, who was a socialite, for lack of a better term, and she was a member of several clubs that um, that really had had her hands in a lot of different things, from music to art and different things. So anyway, um, there were a lot of clubs that, that kind of came and went over the years, and there are some clubs now that um, that I've run across that, that no longer exists. We'll get to some of those shortly too. Um, I also got a message this week from Scott Warner and um, Scott sent me a really nice message too and I read a little bit of his message. It says, Hi Randy, I watched your show on YouTube early and I thought I could help with the mystery. He's referring to the mystery about the, the building on the Emerson shop uh, grounds out there. It says the attached photo was taken by Doug Riddle when he worked in Rocky Mount. I believe it's the mystery building in the, mur in the mural and I believe that the term markup is correct. Um, IRC referred to signing up for roots. I suppose it was like how USPS mail carriers bid on roots. Anyway, I'm guessing the building was some sort of administrative office. 
Uh, Doug Riddell wrote a magazine article called, now that was railroading, and it was about Tom Edwards of Rocky Mount. I believe that the woman who contra uh, contacted you is Mr. Edwards' daughter or granddaughter. Uh, here he's referring to Miss Joyce Dantzler. Joyce contacted me and wanted me to come down and look at the mural at the Rocky Mount uh, train uh, museum at the train station down there and see if I could provide any additional information, history, or so forth on the image, uh, the building, excuse me. Uh, the building was painted, if you remember from last week's show, it was a painting that was done that had um, um, a picture of the building and a train in the foreground and actually um, that building, that painting was done from a photograph. And so anyway, long story short, um, he says that um, Doug Riddell took some pictures and I think we may, we may not have those pictures tonight. I do apologize. I realized when I got here tonight, um, when I reached my pocket to grab my flash drive that I normally bring our pictures in, uh, I didn't have it. And so um, I immediately called my son and asked him to bring it to me and I, I'm hearing some echoes in the control room that I think we might not still not have the right flash drive. So we may not have these pictures tonight and I, if we don't I do apologize. Uh, we'll try to make do without the pictures tonight but in any case um, it's always good to hear from the viewers and as I said uh, I want to thank Don and, and uh, Scott Warner both for sending me this information and uh, if we don't get to the pictures tonight, well, I promise you we will get to them next week. Uh, and I apologize again. I, it, it's sounding like from what, what I'm overhearing in the control room that we still don't have the pictures here that, that are prepared for tonight's show. Uh, I think the flash drive in question is still stuck into my computer where I copied them early tonight when I was getting ready for tonight's show. Um, I also got a, a nice message uh, today, in fact, from Miss uh, Jardine Mosley Jackson. Um, her family owned the Mosley Motel, Shady Lake Motel out on 301, and she sent me a nice picture, and again, it's on that flash drive of all the other pictures, so uh, I may not get that on the show night either. If not, I promise next week we will. And um, so, yeah. that being said, what, uh, what we're gonna try to do tonight in, in lieu of having the pictures, I ran across a neat article, and I'm gonna read this because it, it just it brought back so many great memories for me. Um, and it actually covers a span of about uh, 25 years, from 1935 to 1959. And this is an article that actually appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram. Um, and I'm not exactly sure of the time frame. Uh, sometime in the probably late 60s, maybe early 70s, this article appeared. Uh, but the writer was a gentleman named John Henderson. Many of you may remember John Henderson, who was a writer for the Rocky Mount Telegram many years ago. And this is a collection of memories, and it's, it's several pages, but it's just it's just a neat walk down history's uh, lane right here in our hometown of Rocky Mount. So while the guys in the control are working on, see if we can get some pictures together back there, and again, that may not happen. Um, I'm gonna share with you what I think is a little, a neat little walk down history, and it happened right here in Rocky Mount. And also, I wanted to mention too, you know, um, and I, I'm very careful during this show, I want to make sure that we keep the topic and keep the focus of the show on history and historical information. Um, so I, I try to, at all costs, avoid delving into politics or those kind of areas that can sometimes get kind of muddy, if you know what I mean. Um, but you know, one of the things that, that came back to me very clear, clearly when I read this article today, or yesterday when I first saw it, um, and it speaks to uh, the parity, if you will, over the years between Nash County and Edgecombe County. And I ran across an article, too, that talks about um, federal money that was brought into the Rocky Mount area and how that money was divvied up between Nash County and Edgecombe County. And, you know, we did a show a couple of weeks ago about when the county line was moved uh, from down by uh, Rocky Mountain Mills over to the railroad tracks. And there's been a bit of misinformation for lack of a better term. I don't want to accuse anybody of anything intentional. We just have some misinformation being put out that ever since that happened, Edgecombe County has been lacking in some way. The Edgecombe County has not been able to grow and experience the same kind of growth that Nash County has. While that may be true as far as, you know, Edgecombe County not progressing the way Nash County has, uh, I think this article and some other pictures that we may get to tonight and may not may shed some light on that and actually surprisingly so because it frankly just isn't true. 
So anyway, without further ado, I'm going to read this. Um, it's a great little, as I said, it's a trip down memory lane here in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. It says, Rocky Mountain was bustling from World War II to the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. Tobacco and textile industries were thriving. Rocky Mountain Mills, a historic cotton mill, was in full swing. Downtown retail businesses were packed with customers as railroads, Emerson shops employed more than 2,000 people. People who lived here during the second 25 years of Rocky Mount Telegram's existence from 1935 to 1959 have fond memories. Downtown was vibrant, says 94-year-old Kate Harrison, whose husband, William, later served as mayor from 1962 to 1964. We didn't have shopping centers. This was before any of those came along. All three blocks on both sides of the railroad tracks were full of businesses and active. We had probably three or four theaters. Cresses and Woolworths, five and dime stores drew throngs of customers. We had big tobacco warehouses, Harrison said. All the tobacco trading was going on. It was a booming time. It was interesting. During the war era, Edgecombe County side of Rocky Mount was as alive and vibrant as Nash County side, Harrison said. The Edgecombe County side was full of pretty houses, nice homes, and people taking care of them. It was more of a united town. You know, as a child, I remember, and I'm sure many of you do too, many of you grew up on the Edgecombe side of town, um, riding down Sycamore Street and Eastern Avenue and some of the homes that were on that part of town were just really magnificent homes, still are to this day for that matter. Um, there was a lot of old money, to use an old phrase, about, um, you know, historical areas, and, and certainly Edgecombe County side of Rocky Mount was, was included in that. I mean, there was just a lot of, there were bankers and lawyers and very prominent business people who lived on the Edgecombe County side of Rocky Mount. So it's just, it's just inaccurate to portray Edgecombe County as being lacking uh, or being somehow deprived or being somehow not, as, not equal, in other words, to Nash County. It's just not true. And history tells us that over and over again. Um, soldiers regularly came, came through town on trains, stopping off at the old Masonic Temple on Church Street that served as a USO center for soldiers. It was a big dropping off place from Camp Lejeune, Harrison said. Volunteers went down to meet trains to serve coffee and donuts for soldiers when they got off. The Ricks Hotel across from the train station held large parties and banquets. We all had a good time, Harrison said. If we had a dinner together, everyone brought something and put it on the table. Nobody had much money, but we had a good time. Admission to Saturday night dances at Benvenu Country Club was a dollar. People from throughout the region in towns like Enfield, Wilson, Battleboro, Scotland Neck attended the dances. There was a live orchestra, Harrison said. Something happened every Saturday night and it was always fun. People from all over the state came to Rocky Mount to attend June German dances where big bands performed in tobacco warehouses. It was very well known. You would stay up all night long dancing and going to parties, Harrison said. Life magazine even profiled the dances which were more popular prior to World War II. The war era stopped it, Harrison said. Along came going steady. That didn't work at June German dances where it was normal to regularly switch dance partners. Helen Wilkinson, 90, said the dances were innocent fun with boys wearing tuxedos. There wasn't a lot of drinking and carrying on, she said. It was just fun. The dances had three intermissions when people would go to someone's home for a break. Food and refreshments would be served. They'd serve you something to drink and eat. It wasn't always alcohol. The June German dances featured cheek-to-cheek -cheek dancing with beautiful music, Wilson said. The jumping jive didn't start until a little later than that. There were June German dances for black people on different nights in the same tobacco warehouses, Wilkinson said. We'd all go to the black June Germans, which was wonderful, she said. We were spectators. Downtown was the focal point of business during the World War II era, she said. Everything was downtown, all the dress shops. We had five drug stores on Main Street. You could drive up and blow your horn and the employees would come out. You could order a Coke and they'd bring it to your car. Residents were frugal and conscious of the war effort, she said. We saved 10 cans for the war effort. We were all on rations. They also saved old tires, anything recycled to use for the war. Wilkinson said people weren't rich, but that didn't stop them from enjoying themselves. It was a good time, she said. We didn't have a lot of money, but we didn't know it. You didn't realize you were poor, but you were. You know, my mother said that many times when I was a child. We did, she said that we were poor growing up, but we didn't know it. He goes on to say, it was a fun time too. We all had a lot of friends. Um, Wilkinson and her friends grew up on the Edgecombe County side of Rocky Mount. 
when some of us moved, uh, some of us moved to Nash County, we all put on skates and skated across the county lines to see friends, she said. My husband and I used to ride bikes all over Rocky Mount, particularly on Sundays. And it goes on to say that the railroad and its Emerson shops were at the heart of the city's economic vitality during World War II, said Bill Kinchelow, owner of Wildwood Lamps and Accents on Paul Street. A few blocks away is a building that once housed Emerson shops, a bustling train car repair and service station for the Atlantic Coastline Railroad. From the 1930s through the 1940s, the railroad shops employed about 2,200 people. Kinchelow has fond memories of the busy shops and the numerous businesses that sprang up to serve railroad employees who at the time were among the better paid in the area. The Emerson shops closed when the trains no longer had to stop in Rocky Mount for coal and water. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, they rapidly switched from steam to diesel locomotives and trains would run farther without, no, without service. Kinchelow said the railroad is what put Rocky Mount on the map and played an integral role in the city's economic uh, growth during World War, uh, both World Wars and through the 1950s. Okay, we're almost at the end here. There were side tracks that went to tobacco warehouses, Rocky Mount Mills and other places, Kinsley said. There's a lot more continuous activity on the tracks, plus a whole lot more passenger trains. We had north-south trains, pr principally from New York to Florida. They all passed through Rocky Mount. But then there were local tracks that went to Norfolk, Plymouth, Wilmington, Fayetteville, there were lots of passenger trains. The Emerson shops were a major employer, Kinsler said. The tobacco industry may have had more total employees, but as far as one corporation, I'm sure the biggest employer by far was the Emerson shops in those days. Many products were delivered to businesses by train, including furniture to his family's business, Bullock Furniture Company, on the corner of Western Avenue and Main Street. Furniture damage during delivery would be repaired at the Emerson shops. They had a woodworking shop where they could repair the finest piece of furniture, he said. Kinsolo said railroad cars delivered coal to the uh, former Rocky Mount Power Plant, plant which is now Chico, the home uh, to Chico's Mexican restaurant. There was just lots of railroad activity, he said. There were several department stores. Belts was downtown. There were several five and ten cent stores. Um, said soldiers came into town uh, often with prized possessions, Hershey's and Heath candy bars. You couldn't buy them, but the soldiers could buy them from PX's on base. My father would come home on leave and bring two or three boxes of Hershey's or Heath bars. I'd stand out in front of the furniture store and sell them. You could sell them in a heartbeat, but I didn't try to make any big money. They sold for a nickel, and that's what I, was, and that's what I sold them for. Um, in August, department stores would set up outside tables to sell balls of string that were used to tie together tobacco leaves before they were hung up in a drying barn. That's how important tobacco was. Farmers came to town on Saturday. I can remember them going with horse carts even up into the late 1940s. It was vibrant. There was a lot going on. Okay, you know, this, this goes on for a few more pages. I'm going to stop here because I just realized we're past our first commercial break. But, you know, the bottom line for me is Rocky Mount certainly in the past has, has had its glory days, if you want to call it glory days. Um, and I don't believe that Rocky Mount is a dead city by any stretch. You know, um, we certainly have every opportunity to uh, to have some glory days once again. But when you read articles like this and you think back about how it used to be, some of this stuff is admittedly before my time. I wasn't born until 1959, but some of this stuff was still very much apparent, very much still in, in activity uh, when I was a small child. And, and I do remember some of this stuff. But, uh, you know, it's a shame that Rocky Mount has had such a negative uh, reputation for so long now. And I just hope and pray that we can get past all this negativity and get back to at least a, some semblance of what we had back during these glory days. With that being said, Lee, let's take our first commercial break. Folks, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back in a few minutes with more Way Back Wednesday. Don't go anywhere. Now watching Way Back Wednesday. Sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services, 
to a cremation's on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitations and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. Faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. That's Tender Touch Home Care Services' goal, providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation, to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. And we're back. We're back. Well, try as we might, we could not come up with the figure for the night show. I do apologize. It's entirely my fault. Um, every week, I compile a bunch of pictures, and I put them on a little thumb drive or flash drive, and I stick it in my pocket. I bring it out to the station. I give it to Lee, and he plugs it in his computer right there, and he shows all the pictures that I brought in. And tonight, in my haste to get here, I walked out of my office and left that flash drive plugged into my computer. And so... My son, Daniel, I'll give him credit. I called him and said, can you bring me my flash drive? Well, as a matter of fact, I had two or three flash drives on my desk, and he grabbed the first one he saw, and obviously it was the wrong one. So, but we do have some pictures. Uh, Lee just reminded me that we didn't get to all the pictures we had last week, and there was, I don't know, maybe seven or eight of those. But before we get to those, uh, during the break, I happen to remember, I did bring something else I wanted to share with you. And, and this really should go along with some pictures, and I... That, that were on that flash drive that we don't have. So I can't show you the pictures, but um, it, it actually, it tells a little bit of history about Tar River. You know, we talk a lot about the railroad and how important the railroad was the development of Rocky Mount uh, from the early, oh golly, 1839, I think was when the railroad first hit Rocky Mount, the Wilmington Weldon Railroad. And then from that point on, it was just, I mean, it was almost like an immediate boom to, the, to this area, not only Rocky Mountain, but to Eastern North Carolina as a whole. And then as the railroad grew and, and the population of Rocky Mountain grew, um, it was just a, a bustling time for several decades, uh, from about mid-1800s all the way up through the mid-1900s. And so, you know, there's, um, we often forget that prior to the railroads coming to Rocky Mountain, um, we had horse and buggy trails, or everyone rode stagecoach, um, but there was also a lot of river traffic, especially between the coast and up to about as far as Tarboro. Um, due to Rocky Mount's proximity on the Tar River being right here at the fall line, um, it really wasn't practical for boats to navigate further upstream than, than a, about Tarboro, even though there were some 
boats that made it up close to the Rocky Mountain Mills area. Um, for the most part, it was from Tarbur back down toward the coast that most of the river traffic uh, took place. But you know, some time ago, it's been a few years ago now, there was an old flat bottom barge that was, on, that was found uh, over between Rocky Mountain and Tarboro um, in the Tar River when the river was very low. It had gotten uncovered, for, I guess currents, shifting and so forth. And uh, I went out there, in fact, I think my wife and my son had went out there and looked at that. You could see it standing on the bridge looking down the river. You could see, uh, not very clearly, because it was, like I said, it was basically a, a collapsed hull of a boat, but you could still, still see the outline of the boat there in the sand. Uh, and it was just, you know, a, a kind of a, a flashback to a time when there were flat bottom paddle boats up and down the Tar River. And so this is an article um, that's called River Boats of the Tar River. And it's subtitled Forgotten Places and Boats. And it tells a little bit of a story about the boat traffic up and down the Tar River. It says roads were generally poor in Edgecombe County until well after the Civil War. The railroad didn't come to Tarboro until 1882 in part because this because the Tar River was navigable as far up river as Tarboro. Steamboats steam did a thriving business transporting cargo and people. On January 27, 1962, oh I'm sorry, the January 27, 1962 edition of the Daily Reflector carried an article that follows about a trip down the Tar River in 1888. So this article was from 1888 and it appeared in 1962 in an edition of the Daily Reflector. Okay, it says, uh, about the turn of the century when railroads began to come into the county, the day of the steamboat of the tar started to fade, and along with their going out of the small landing places that owed their existence to the steamboat began to lose their significance, and in some cases their identity. And along the march with the progress, the names of the steamboats, names almost as familiar as those of the people that live on the river, became something to be remembered. In 1888, young Bruce Coffin of Coffindale made a trip down the tar on the steamer, the Greenville. In his book, written when he was grown, he tells some of the sights and landing places he saw on his way down the river. The steamer Greenville was the finest on the river. Her skipper was Captain Mayo, and he was assisted by polite and attentive officers. The Greenville also set a first-class table furnished with the best the markets offer. It also boasted of the finest and quickest service on the river with adequate accommodations for the ladies. The Greenville pulled out from Tarboro on, e on even days of the week at 6 a.m. Eight miles below Tarboro, the steamer pulled into Old Sparta, the tiny village, the first place settled on the tar. As the Greenville started on down the river, she passed Carr's Landing and went on toward Penny Hill, which was two miles further downstream. Here at Penny Hill, named for free women of color who used to sell tobacco and eatables for the flat men of early days, the tar widens. Penny Hill had a good landing place and was, very, was a very attractive spot. After unloading some freight and taking on a passenger or two, the Greenville steamed on. Next was Dupree's Landing, and as there was nothing on board for this place, the boat went the three miles to the landing for Falkland and pulled in toward the shore. The place was known as Tobacco Patch and earlier than that Williams Landing. Sometime before the Civil War, a store was open here. On the whole, the place was an unhealthy one. It was due to this fact that some pre-Civil War uh, fellow named Pillsbury on it. Uh, <clears throat> it's kind of hard to read here. It's a little, little uh, garbled. It's, anyway, it says it was stuck to this day. The, modem, the modern bridge that crosses Tar River at this point is called Pillsbury Bridge. Just below Pillsboro stood Bensboro, an old home place of the Atkinson family. For many years, Bensboro had a post office, a store, and a ferry. Old Bensboro placed the legend of the mirrors with it, magnolia trees, and boxwood gardens. One mile down river, the Greenville came to Center Bluff, where the coffins had a store and a landing. On to Greenville. After pulling out from Center Bluff, the Greenville passed Reeves Landing, Blue Banks, Randall's Barn and Slaughterhouse Point. At Greenville, much freight was unloaded and many passengers went ashore. And then freight and passengers came aboard. Then with the blast of her whistle, the boat started again. Below Greenville, the steamer passes Red Banks. Here there was a tobacco inspection station in 1725. A ferry once crossed the river here and one of the earliest churches in the county stood. 
The boat picked up speed as I went by what was once Barber's Landing, nor did it slow down for John Simpton's Landing. Both of those places had long lost their importance. After pacing, uh, passing Great Bend, the river widens and it's easy sailing to the end of the trip. The banks of the river are lined with great trees and rank underbrush. The captain relaxes, the worst is over. Most of the sandbars and snags have been passed. Ahead can be seen the spires of the churches and buildings of Washington. As the steamer nears the town of Six Forks of the Tar, people start getting ready to set their feet on dry land. The deck hands look to their ropes and the freight handlers make ready to unload. Tomorrow and every uneven day of the week but Sunday, the Greenville would go back to Tarborough, passing the same small landing places, loading and unloading. This was yesterday. This was yesterday a long time ago. The names of the boats that piled the river are, not, are but forgotten, tucked away in some faded print or in the minds of one or two old timers who remember, long gone are the boats. The Amidas from 1849, the first permanent one assigned to the Tar. The Post Boy, the Governor Moorhead, both destroyed when the Yankees took Tarbor in 1863. The Steam Wheeler Cotton Plant, freighter and one-time tender of the Ram Albemarle ending her day or being burned above Old Sparta. The Myers under the card playing Captain Porbin. The Tarbora, the Shiloh, and others that dodge the sandbars and snags of the river all gone. But they say all of those, the Greenville was the most famous of the steamers that swam the tar. Um, you know, I, I had heard and read before that there were steamships and paddle boats and flat bottom bodies that traversed Tar River. Um, I was not aware, however, of, of the luxury uh, pipe boat that obviously this Greenville boat was. And um, it's kind of neat to, to learn about this, this bit of history about the Tar River. You know, as a lot of young kids around here, I spent a lot of time growing up around the Tar River, fishing, swimming, um, chasing uh, everything from uh, birds and ducks and, and snakes sometimes too, uh, avoiding some, I might say, also. But uh, the Tar River's got a, you know, a special place in my heart, as I'm sure it does a lot of you too, and especially those that grew up down around the, the Mill Hill down there. Um, it's just some really fond memories of the Tar River in general, but particularly of the people and, and the activities that used to be, uh, that used to take place on that river. Um, you know, there were two local uh, cruise boats uh, that I read about, uh, one called the Exchange Ike that was actually uh, purchased and paid for and, and upkept by a local club called the Exchange Ike Club. And there's another boat called the Princess. And both of these boats, uh, different times, uh, would offer cruises up and down the Tar River. They would load down by Sunset Park down there. There was a landing down there. And they would go down as far as they would go down toward the dam and turn and come back up and go back up past Power Plant as far as they would go back up that way toward um, just, just south of the uh, uh, Power Plant and then trying to come back. And, um, and that was a, a pretty common occurrence from back in uh, old GG from 1940s up through early 1950s. Uh, we talked earlier, my son and I, about uh, people water skiing on the Tar River. I have memories of seeing folks water ski on the Tar River, and that's something that I haven't seen done in, oh golly, 40 years or more, I'm sure, maybe longer than that now. Um, but before the, the reservoir was built out there in the early 70s, uh, it was pretty commonplace to see people with boats and water skiing and pleasure cruising on all any number of boats out on, put in at Sunset Park down there and cruise up and down the river there for hours on end on Saturday and Sunday afternoons, especially when the weather was nice like it is now. So anyway, I'll tell you what, um, we're at a good point to take our next commercial break. When we come back, I do promise we do have some pictures. Lee has found some that we didn't get to last week. So when we come back from the break, we'll show those. We'll take your phone calls. And uh, I apologize again. We, we have, I had some really neat pictures tonight, and I'm sorry I didn't get those into the station. But we do have some to show you. So when we come back from the break, we'll get right to those. So don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back with more Way Back Wednesday. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work.
I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitation and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. When faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. That's Tender Touch Home Care Services' goal, providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. And we're back, we're back, folks. Watching Way Back Wednesday. Uh, we've so far tonight have not shown any pictures, and that's entirely my fault. I do apologize. Um, big goofball than I am. I'm such a hurry to get here tonight. I walked out and forgot my flash drive with all my pictures on it. So we've got a few pictures we're going to show you here in just a minute. Lee has found some for last week that we didn't get to. So we're going to share those with you. Uh, during the break, I had a caller to call and ask me, did I know anything about a boat that was found? She thinks it was last year sometime. I suppose a couple of local farmers maybe found it in some woods. Uh, she thinks it was some kind of metal boat, aluminum maybe. Uh, but apparently it was a very old boat, so I, I can't say I remember anything specific about this. So I'm hoping one of your viewers can shed some light on this. Uh, but somewhere, um, I guess somewhere around Battleboro, uh, this area out here, um, there was this boat that was found in the woods, maybe in a, in a ditch or a ravine or somewhere in the woods. But if you know anything about uh, this uh, boat that was found or remember hearing a story about it, give us a call, 407 11 11 is the number. Um, and I'm sorry I don't have any information on it, but maybe one of the viewers does, and if you do, give us a call, we'll share it with the rest of the viewers. Uh, before we get to the pictures, and I had really intruded some really neat pictures tonight that, I, that we'll get to next week, I promise. But I had some really neat pictures of the Tar River and, and boats that were on the Tar River in, in years past. And so one of the main things that tonight's show was going to be, as you can tell obviously, uh, was the Tar River. And, um, and there's a lot of history, as I've said before, that many of us don't know anything about way before our time, obviously. I mean, the, the traffic on the Tar River goes back to the 1700s and probably back before that. Uh, there were certainly um, Native Americans that were traveling up and down the Tar River on, on dugout canoes and so forth well before any white man came along here. So it's safe to say that for several hundred years there were, there were people traveling up and down Tar River uh, by some means. But um, there was actually a company that was started uh, it was called the Tar River Navigation Company. And um, I found this little short article here. I just want to share this with you before we get into the pictures. But it says, that, and it's talking about the Tar River. It says, the Tar River rising in Person County and flowing southeast to Beaufort, where it becomes the Pamlico River, first drew legislative attention in 1784 when, General Assembly, when the General Assembly directed the Pitt, Edgecombe, and Halifax County Courts to clear the river of obstructions in their respective jurisdictions. Now keep in mind, in 1784 there was no Nash County yet, at least, oh, let me back up, there was not a Nash County in very close proximity to Tall River, put it that way. Um, the county line hadn't been moved yet, so anyway, uh, at this time we're talking about Pitt, Edgecombe, and Halifax counties, but the Tall River Navigation Company was incorporated in 1816 and given control of the tar from its source to Greenville 
and its and the tributaries, including Fishing Creek, for which a Fishing Creek Navigation Company was incorporated by the same act. Capitalized at $75,000, the Tar River Company was permitted to cha uh, charge a toll on traffic using the river to compensate for its efforts to improve the navigability of the tar. Incorporating statute amended in 1818 also promised a state stock subscription of $8,000. From the outset, the company faced almost insurmountable obstacles, not only from the river itself, but also from opponents of internal improvements in the region. Although investors subscribed to $56,000 worth of stock, Many subsequently refused to meet this obligation and the company had to bring lawsuits to force payment. The Tar River Navigation Company contracted for the construction of a lock and dam at Pippins Falls for $3,100, but the contractor abandoned the work before completion. Concerned about protecting the public's investment, the legislature in 1823 instructed the state treasurer to withdraw the state subscription to stock until he could determine that the company had been legally organized that individual subscribers were buying their shares and that the company agreed to have its operations managed by the Board of Internal Improvements. Apparently the company failed to meet these criteria for the state. Um, only, the state only purchased uh, $1,200 of the $8,000 stock subscription. According to an 1834 report by the Board of Internal Improvements, the stockholders had not met for many years. The company presumably was defunct. So there was at one point a Tar River Navigation Company um, that was tasked with trying to keep navig uh, navigation open along the Tar River, certainly through uh, Halifax, Pitt, Edgecombe counties, uh, as the Tar River meandered its way through those counties, headed toward the coast. Um, that was a tall order, obviously. Uh, you know, if you spend any time on Tar River, you know um, there are parts where it's really, really shallow, other parts where there are large boulders in the middle of the river. Um, uh, I know out here on my Sunset Park, for example, uh, we used to go swimming out there at a place called Flat Rock, and when the river's low, you could stand out there uh, just about the middle of the river and ankle deep water if you stand on one of those flat rocks. And you might step off into a six or eight foot depth, but there's huge boulders just below the surface out there, and it's that way throughout a good, be a good deal of the Tar River. Uh, if you know the channels, you can boat along pretty easily, but you got to know those channels. But the point is that there's a, there's a lot of obstacles uh, to keeping a river like the Tar River open for navigation. And certainly, um, it, in this case, just wasn't feasible for this business, and they eventually folded up, went out of business. So, all right, so I mentioned we got some pictures. We don't have many, and that's my fault again. I, I apologize uh, for this, I know, but I, I just feel bad that I didn't bring the pictures I, that I meant to bring. But Lee's going to save the night for us anyway. So, Lee, I'm not sure where we're at. I don't even have my list from last week. So, uh, I think these are all from the Albert Rabel. Okay, first of all, this is the picture that uh, Scott Warner was referencing and he sent me some pictures uh, that were actually pictures of the, and, and I mentioned last week, this was a painting right here. And this was done by uh, some students at Nash Central High School. And uh, Joyce Dancer, the curator at the Rocky Mount Railroad Museum, contacted me and wanted some more information about that building. And she referred to it a couple times and it sounded like she was saying either mock-up or mark-up building. And I searched high and low, could not find anything referencing either mark-up or mock-up. But uh, as I said earlier, uh, Scott Warner sent me some pictures. He had talked to a gentleman, uh, so Doug Rydell, and had a little bit of history on the building. And so we do have, and I'll get those in next week, I promise, we do have some actual photographs of that building. Um, we're not exactly sure when this uh, picture that this painting was made from was taken, and the pictures that I have are not the same image because it's just a picture of the building itself, not with the train there in, in the foreground. But in any case, um, this is what kind of prompted a little bit of investigation, and I had some really neat pictures too, and again, we'll get to those next week, of other uh, portions of the Emerson shops and some maps and so forth to go along with it too. Okay, let's go to the next one if we could, Dan. And I think we did see this one last week. This is the back side of the Peacock Meat Company. If you remember, Eric called in and told us about the, the left-hand side of this building, a little narrow door there in the fenced-in area was where they bring livestock in to be slaughtered in that, in that room there. All right, let's get this caller here. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Yeah, uh, Randy, markup is a railroad term for uh, claiming a job or a train or 
or whatever, and that building was where the engine side, which which handled the engineers and the uh, firemen, the clerk was in that that handled all of that, and that's where the engine crews went on duty. That is, is the engine house office. Engine house office? Yes, yeah, just inside the gate when you go in Washington Street and take a right, mm -hmm. and that's where all of the engine crews went to work. Okay, so now t say again, explain to a little more detail if you would about the markup, how it became known as the markup building. That was a term, a railroad term you said? Yeah, markup is, is the terminology for signing up on a job or a train, a yard engine or whatever the case may be. That's That was the terminology when you took that job you marked up on. I got you. Okay. Well, you're the first one to to recognize that term and share that with us. So I really do appreciate it. And this is great because um, I don't know how much Joyce knows about the markup process and how that building came to be known as the markup building. But she asked me to see what I could find from a historical standpoint. And, and they wanted to put a little inf informative plaque beneath this mural they got on the wall there at the Railroad Museum. And that's what precipitated all this. So. I have looked high and low trying to find some reference to a markup building or a mock-up building. Couldn't find anything. So I thank you, thank you for well, they, enlightening. They moved. They moved. That office. They moved it from that office down to the tunnels at the CO building. Mm -hmm. Long about long about 1975 when uh, Amtrak took over. That was kind of a, a shake-up. And when Amtrak took over, that kind of shook up everything. But they moved, they moved that clerk from there to the CO building at the tunnels. So is this building still there, you think, this markup building? I don't know if it's all. Uh, so been I, I never heard it, I never heard it called the markup building, but that's what markup means. Gotcha. On okay. the railroad, and that was, that was the building where it was done, so. Uh -huh. But whether it's there or not now, I do not know. It housed the hall. Uh, the engine house foreman's office was in it. And it's also uh, where the hostler went on duty, which was the, which the people that fueled and took care of the engines and got them ready to go out on trains. And, and what do you call them again? Hostler? Hostlers, yeah. H-O-S-L-E-R? S-H-O-S-T-L-E-R. That's another phrase I've not heard before. <laughs> okay. I'm learning about railroading tonight, I guess. Okay. Well, they're the, they're, they're the guys that uh, that put fuel on the engines and sand and uh, and take different engines and put them together to make consists to go out on a train. Okay. So they were caretakers so for the engines. If you remember the big fuel the big fuel tanks, uh, were down there uh, right behind that building and right behind the Emerson shops was the big fuel tanks where all of the uh, diesel diesel fuel was stored and there was pumping stations down there where they filled the engines up. Right, and that, the pictures that I that I did not bring tonight, I've got one picture, has got a picture of that markup building or this building we're talking about, and in the background you can see those huge tanks you're talking about. So I will definitely share those on next week's show, but yeah, this is, this is very enlightening. I thank you for sharing this with us. Yes, sir, I enjoyed it. All right, buddy, thank you. Have a good night. Yes, sir, you too. All right, thank you. Okay, that's what this show is all about right there. We learn something every week, and honestly, um, whether the building was referred to as a markup building by the, by the employees or not, and it sounded like perhaps it probably was not, but now it all makes sense um, that um, this building had a function and it had a purpose, and it sounded like two or three purposes, in fact, for that matter, but um, I'm so glad to, that what I'll do is get this information together and get it to Joyce over at the Rocky Mount Railroad Museum next week with some pictures I've got of maps and so forth. So, okay. All right then, great. Well, Lee, let's go ahead then. Let's move on to our next picture. And this was another one of these, uh, I think we showed this last week too, but we'll show it again. This is from uh, 1950s, and Al Rabel took these pictures, Albert Rabel. Uh, he was a brother to B.D. Rabel. Many of you remember B.D. Rabel here in Rocky Mount. But Al Rabel, um, Took a lot of pictures too, nowhere near as many as Bugs Barringer or Charlie Killebrew, but uh, he had a very good eye as well, some very good camera equipment as well. And uh, this picture was taken at the Elks Lodge, uh, a, a Christmas party for the kids there. 
and there was some discussion at last week's show about whether or not this was actually a home that the Elks Lodge had, uh, some kind of boarding home or whatever. Uh, it, I, we don't think it was the Elks Lodge itself, uh, but maybe more so just a home that that the Elks kept up maybe somehow and, and maintain it, and it was like a boarding home, we guess. But anyway, this was a Christmas party that was held at um, on behalf of the Elks Lodge, I guess you'd say. Okay. Another picture here, and again, this is Christmas. Um, these were 1950, 1951 time frame, and um, same same group, same um, facility, same building, I should say, and same time frame. So, okay, Lee. Um, this is a Girl Scout. Um, you know, both Bugs Barringer and Charlie Killer took a bunch of pictures of Scouts, and Al Rabel did too. In fact, this is a don't know who this young lady is. She was identified as Girl Scout. Uh, in a uniform with the American flag there, uh, but uh, this again, these with the dark background were all BD, uh, not BD, uh, our or our label photographs. Okay, Lee, let's go to the next one then. And these are Boy Scouts, and you can see there the old canvas tent there. They're um, unraveled it and fixing to put stakes in the ground. And I don't know who these young fellows are here, but. Uh, as a former scout myself, I can attest to the fun that was often associated with going on camping trips with the Boy Scouts. I had some of the best times of my life uh, going on camping trips and camperies and so forth with the Boy Scouts as a young young tyke. And uh, it's a good way for a young fellow to spend some time. All right, Lee, let's go to the next picture then. And this is the man. This is Albert Al Rabel himself with his camera. You can see. Uh, this is from, again, in 1950s. Kind of reminded me of Danny Thomas a little bit in this picture here. Uh, for those that remember Danny Thomas, um, can you zoom in a little bit, Lee? Just kind of get a little bit closer look on his on his face. Nice looking fellow there. Um, obviously, that camera was a fairly nice camera too. I, I don't know anything about camera brands or models, but um, he was a very young man here, obviously. and um, But he did. That camera took some very good pictures and uh, I think this is the last one in this grouping of, of his pictures. And I'm not sure, is there anything beyond this, Lee? Red man, flower. Okay, we've got a couple ads that I found. Yeah, we'll go ahead and bring those up too, if you would. These are just ads that I pulled from the Rocky Mount Telegram. Um, this one here is uh, just an advertisement for Red Band Enriched Flower. And um, I, I can't say I remember this particular brand, maybe some of you do. But uh, it was a pretty good size ad appeared in the telegram. And again, these are all from the 1950s. Most all these pictures were taken from 1948, 49 up to like 51 or 52. And um, there may be others that uh, Al Rabel took, but this one collection spanned those four or five years. Okay, Lee, what's next? Okay, here we go. My old place of employment. I worked for Mr. Flake Chipley um, when I was in high school. Uh, but uh, 118 North Church Street was the location of his lot and at this time in the 1950s before he sold uh, Mercury's he was a Renault dealer and when I worked there in the late 70s well I was about mid 70s 74 75 I worked there and um, there was we still had up in the in the, what we called the loft upstairs a um, bunch of old Renault parts in fact uh, I bought a Renault from it, that a, that a gentleman had brought in to have it worked on and uh, had some other, so many uh, bad parts of the man didn't want to fix it. When he found out what it was going to cost to fix it, he didn't want to fix it. And so I bought the car and ended up getting it running and drove it for, I don't know, a year or so before I sold it myself. But uh, yeah, a lot of folks didn't realize Mr. Chipley had a Renault dealership, or Renault as the French say. I always call it Renault, but I've been corrected a few times over the years and, and I understand the French refer to it as Renault. So there you go. All right, Lee, and that's the last one there. Uh, this was. Can you zoom in on this, Lee? This is actually, I think, a uh, ad about the. Um, there you go. This is just an ad that the Telegram put out. Uh, it just mentions a bunch of uh, local businesses, and it's, these are advertisers in the Telegram. Um, I haven't seen one of these uh, orange, even Telegram. Uh, newspaper stands in many many years. I don't know if there's any more even out there now, but uh, this was actually um, the paper was saying you can buy the paper at these locations. That's what it was. It was, it was an advertisement advertising where you could go and one of these stands would be outside the business if you wanted to buy paper. So anyway, all right Lee, bring it back to me. Folks, that's going to wrap it up for us tonight. Um, 
good headline there. We'll, we'll get to that next week too. Uh, again, I want to thank you all for watching and uh, express my humble apologies for not having the picture tonight. That's entirely my fault, so I'll take the beating for that. But um, glad you could join us, and we will have some pictures next week. So have just a great week, folks. Take care of yourselves and be kind to each other. We'll see you next week and more Way Back Wednesday. Good night. You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Flores Glass and Mirror Company. Service in the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work.